This is a webinar from Michigan State University. My name is Anna Heck. I'm an apiculture extension educator and I work at Michigan State. I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Megan, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Megan Milbrath and I'm a researcher and extension specialist at Michigan State. Great. Zachary? Hi, I'm Zachary Hua. I'm an associate professor at Michigan State University. I have been studying bees here for 24 years. Great. And Dan? Dan Wines. I'm a specialist at MSU Entomology with uh, honeybees as well. Great. So we're excited to be here tonight to talk with everyone. Uh, this is a Michigan State University Extension program, and our programs are open to everyone. Uh, this is what we have planned for tonight. So I'll get us started talking about resources and ways to, to stay connected. Then Dan will talk about the Be Informed Partnerships Annual Loss and Management Survey, and he will then talk about resources for installing new colonies. Zach will talk about spring feeding. Megan will talk about splitting established colonies. Um, I'll talk about managing varroa, and then we will all answer your questions. So if you have questions during tonight's webinar, the best place for you to put them is in the Q&A box, uh, which you should find in your Zoom controls. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can tonight. Um, so to get us started, uh, we always want to uh, really appreciate the local bee clubs that we have in Michigan. Uh, Michigan has over 30 beekeeping clubs, and the, they provide local information and resources for beekeepers. So if you're not already part of a bee club, we hope that you find one. Uh, you can find a list of clubs at the Michigan Beekeepers Association's website, which is michiganbees.org, and there you'll find a list of Michigan bee clubs. Uh, MSU's website for bees and beekeepers is pollinators.msu.edu. And if you're looking for our upcoming events, you can find them on the events tab of the website. I also have a QR code on the screen that you can use to pull up that um, website for upcoming events, or you can use the bit.ly shortened link to find our upcoming events. Uh, so we have several upcoming events that we are excited about and that we want to highlight. These include both in-person and virtual events. Um, so tonight is our first a, a beekeeping office hour webinar. We plan to hold these monthly throughout the season. Uh, so the, ne the next one will be on May 22nd. They're all on Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And just like tonight, we'll plan to cover some seasonal management topics and then let you ask your questions and respond to questions. Uh, so this is something we do monthly in order to provide seasonal information to beekeepers and respond to the questions that you have. A couple other events that we're excited to highlight are we um, have a hygienic testing workshop and a queen rearing workshop lined up for Friday, June 16th and Saturday, June 17th. Uh, you can choose if you want to attend one or both of those web, those events, but they're back to back in case people want to attend both. They are in-person workshops that will be held on MSU campus and uh, registrations required that's under the events page. Uh, we also have lots of different beekeeping workshops, uh, some in-person talks to bee clubs, and then some beekeeping workshops on campus or other MSU sites. And we have those in multiple locations at multiple times. So check out our events page to see what's coming up if you're interested. And we also have a way for you to receive regular emails about our upcoming events and articles that we post. Uh, the emails typically go out about once every two weeks. You can sign up by going to our website, um, pollinators.msu.edu, then clicking Stay Connected. Um, and there you'll find a tab for newsletter and you can choose the pollinators and pollination news digest. That's the digest that we work with. Uh, you'll probably also be excited to see there's lots of other really cool topics that MSU Extension has. So uh, check those all out. And there is a QR code on the screen if you want to pull that page up right now to sign up for a news digest. Um, and then the shortened link is on the screen as well. All right. Um, so we'll try to answer as many beekeeping questions as we can tonight in the webinar. Again, please put your beekeeping questions in the Q&A box uh, and we'll get to those at the end. If you have questions in the meantime between webinars, the best way for you to ask them is to use our Ask Extension form, which you can find at pollinators.msu.edu slash questions. 
and it'll bring, give you a form where you can type in a question. You can also upload photos. So if there's something weird going in your, on in your beehive, you can include photos and then we'll get back to you with a response. Uh, we are recording tonight's webinar and we plan to post it on our Michigan State University beekeeping YouTube channel. It does sometimes take us a little while to get the closed captionings ready in order to be able to post it online publicly, um, but you'll be able to find it on the YouTube channel. You may also be interested in seeing our other uh, videos that we have on the channel. We have some on beginning beekeeping topics. We have lots on pollinator habitat and wild bees. Um, so I hope you check out those resources. But next we're gonna go on to the Bee Important Partnerships Annual Loss and Management Survey. And Dan's going to talk about that. Yeah, so as we're still in the month of April, and that's kind of we think of as the, the start of our beekeeping year here in Michigan, um, it also marks the uh, month where the national survey is opened through the Be Informed Partnership. Um, and this survey is, is really important. It's, it's open to all beekeepers, whether you've had one hive for one year or thousands of hives for decades. Um, so it's a way that beekeepers can kind of contribute to this data set. Um, and it's, it's asking questions. Um, the first part is the annual loss survey. And so that's asking questions about how many colonies did you start the year with? Did you make splits? Did you sell any bees? Did you buy any bees? Did you make any combines? And then how many you came through with at the end of the summer and then again the following um, end of the winter. So if you've kept good notes or you can make pretty good estimates, that's really helpful. Um, and it helps, you know, when we see stats published in like, you know, in, in the in the press that says, you know, the nation lost 38% of its bees this last year or whatever that is, that they're most often referencing this survey. It's been going on for over a decade now, and it's a really good, um, you know, longstanding, um, you know, source of information that helps us track the national, you know, kind of our struggles and challenges and successes with with bees and beekeeping. And then the other, the second aspect of the survey is, is the management survey. And so that'll ask you different practices on what you did as far as um, splitting, requeening, um, feeding, treating for mites, um, things like that. So again, if you've kept notes and, and kind of have some records of your beekeeping, which we, we certainly encourage for, for your own just, um, you know, understanding what you did and what worked and what didn't and kind of being able to reflect on things. Um, it's, a, it's a really good way that any beekeeper can contribute to um, this data set that is, is really valuable in helping, you know, bee research um, be directed to, to areas where it's needed and understanding where our problems come from. So um, just uh, to show a, a little bit like this is um, this type of map like this. So this is from last year, um, you know, and as I say, we're the year kind of runs April 1 through the end of March. So we've, we're uh, just finishing up this past year. The survey's open. We will shortly have updated information on this year that's just finished. But you get national loss maps like this, and then we can kind of see, you know, and in Michigan, um, not this immediately finished winter, but the previous winter, you know, we lost about 49%, uh, sorry, about 40% of colonies, 39% there. And, and you kind of get a sense of where that falls in the range of, of different states. Um, this information is available through the Be Informed Partnership as a data explorer. You can go in and look at all this. It's all publicly available. You can also kind of comb through different management practices and what sort of successes or failures that has led to as well. So a lot of information here. Um, thanks, Megan. We got the, the link in the chat there at beinformed.org slash take survey. So you've got another uh, a week left through the end of, end of April here. If, if you have 15, 20 minutes and are able to share that information, it'd be greatly appreciated. The next um, item we're going to discuss, because again, it's April and this is kind of the start of the beekeeping year, is installing new colonies. Um, Probably a lot of you, um, if you're, you know, first year or you're, you're starting over or you're growing and you um, purchase some bees, you need to figure out how to get them into their new home and how to look after them in the early stages of their life. So we have um, some videos we've created here that I direct you towards on um, both installing a nuke and installing a package. These are, these are good. These are something we developed because they are very common questions on the basics. So 
Um, again, both these links are in the chat. I would I would encourage you to just these are good starting points. We will certainly take some questions on these things in the Q and A, but these are great resources to get you started if you are you know I say just getting started with bees this year or fairly early on in your um, beekeeping journey and get these kind of basics uh, basic knowledge under your belt of how to get companies off to a good start. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, next, we're going to turn it over to Zach for spring feeding. Uh, hi, everyone. So I uh, actually published an MSU extension pamphlet uh, about feeding bees. Uh, so in that one, I talk about regular feeding. Didn't really cover spring feeding. Uh, so Regular feeding, we have many different methods, like a top uh, top feeder in inside the hive frame feeder. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't think we, I talked about the winter feeding. So right now it's sort of a tricky situation. It was warm a couple of weeks ago, and now it's suddenly so cold. It's probably cold enough that I would not recommend you do a regular syrup feeding, which is like package B feeding, uh, which will be maybe two weeks away. It'll be okay. You have your package bees set up and you don't have any honey frame from safe uh, food or from dead out colonies that you want to make syrup. So the regular recommendation is use one to one ratio, one. Uh, weight by weight, one part of sugar, one part of water, 50% of sugar, syrup, spring feeding. So right now I think it's tricky that you probably could not do that easily. So it's just between winter and spring, weird situation. So if your bees are indeed lacking food, if you have checking your bees and uh, you think they need sugar, I would recommend sugar board or what's a very popular method now called Mount Camp feeding, which is basically just using dry sugar, uh, spray, some spray with some water moisture to let them uh, cake overnight with a, a small sort of medium or shallow super with a screen under with newspapers lined up. Uh, so this the, the mesh material has to be large enough, usually about this big, the grid, so bees could easily chew over the newspaper and uh, eat the sugar. But the trick is uh, sugar ideally should be caked up uh, before you put onto the colony. That way when the bees are chewing, it doesn't cause an avalanche of uh, dry sugar running down. So, and the traditional way is uh, what's called a sugar board, which is more involved. You have to uh, have certain proportion of sugar and water and some vinegar, and you have to heat it up so high that it melts the sugar, then you pour into a special board, which is shaped like an off cover, but it was a hole this big in the center. Uh, and uh, then you invert the cover, you, you pour the sugar into that and make a solid. So the sugar will solidify when it's cooled. And usually that's, I have used that method before. Usually that's to feed colonies where they run out of food in January or February. Uh, and that was before the mountain cab met method was invented. I think the month cap method just came up maybe last five or six years. Uh, so for regular feeding, consult was the MSU extension uh, pamphlet. So right now, as I said, it's kind of special situation. It's supposed to be spring, but it's cold enough. It still feels like winter. Another thing you could feed, I just fed my colony some uh, pollen patties because I feel like it's too cold for them to go out and they've already started brewing. So they, 
if they have enough sugar, what they need badly is also pollen substitute. Unless you have trapped pollen before, and of course pollen will be actually the best, but pollen substitute will be the second best. And you make a, a patty mixing, uh, usually uh, dry pollen substitute with some a uh, little bit of oil and some syrup to make it a palatable uh, paste. That's not too runny, not too dry, just uh, wet enough you you can handle it and it would uh, not be loose when you squeeze by your hand. And maybe slightly wetter than that, but it doesn't run, doesn't uh, drown the bees. So then you use some wax paper as a base and put that paste on top and right over the cluster, it's fine. And the weather looks like this, it's probably gonna be another week or two. So that would really help the bees. So I think that's all I have to say about spring feeding. Please. Thanks, Zach. That was super useful. Um, so I'm watching the questions in the chat and just as a reminder in the Q&A and people can put them in there anytime. And if they're relevant to the topic, I'll pass them off. But if you don't catch it while we're talking about feeding, we'll happily answer some more questions at the end. Um, so that was a really good overview of the general feeding. There is a question in the chat regarding nukes. And maybe, Anna, if you want to talk about what we're doing nukes, um, the question says, feeding question, I have a nuke that I'll be transferring to a 10 frame brood rock shortly. I have sugar water filled frames left over from another healthy hive and I'll be putting four frames in when I transfer the nuke. Should I also be bucket feeding them one to one syrup right now as well? Great. Yes. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we really want to point out that is that especially for colonies that are new or small in the spring, it's really important and helpful to uh, feed. So, for example, if you have nucleus colonies or package colonies, feeding sugar syrup right now is going to help your colony not only have nutrition, but also have be able to draw more comb, which most of our new colonies need to do. Um, so for our established colonies, you know, our colonies that made it through winter. And if they still have lots of honey, you can decide whether or not you want to feed them right now. Um, but if they are small or if they are light on food, we are feeding our colony sugar syrup, especially if they need to draw a new comb. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there, Megan? No, I think that's it. Um, and I don't see any more questions on feeding in the chat, but Dan, there is one on installation. Maybe you can cover it. It says, is it too late to install packages now? if colonies were lost due to our cold weather, which bees are not lost to cold weather, healthy bees are not. Um, but if not, will there be time for good colony buildup and honey production? So maybe just a little bit about the timing of nukes and yeah. packages. So um, a short answer, yeah, you could still install a package, absolutely. I know we had a, a week of 80 degrees, you know, 10 days ago, and that was great, but we're, we've still got a week left in April. It's still, early in the bee season. Um, so you can absolutely install a package. Um, you know, th that that's very doable. I said, you want to make sure you're feeding it and providing the resources because we our extended forecast is still fairly cool for the next week to 10 days. Um, with the, is there enough time for it to build up and produce a honey crop? Um, <laughs> that depends. And, and a lot of times the answer, even for, for a package in a first year, you're not necessarily, um, you don't want to count on a honey crop that first year, especially if you don't have an inventory of drawn comb. Your first year, if you've got a new colony, you should really be focusing on like letting that animal grow out and mature, like kind of the equivalent of like grow out its frame, grow out its skeleton. Um, so it takes a lot for bees to make wax. If you don't have a lot of that, um, they're going to put a lot of resources in that. And your goal should be to get that drawn out, to have a nice, fat, healthy animal for the winter. Maybe there's, you know, some honey to be had because you're putting time in and that there might be some surplus. But I think that first year, not, not counting on making a ton, regardless of if you start April 15th or April 25th. Um, so, but I think you can still certainly install a package now. 
Um, one more feeding question, and I think we can do maybe just a round robin of if what people have had with experience for this about if you should be adding any supplements like Hive Alive or um, Super DFM. I'll start. So um, we don't use those. So I don't have a lot of experience to share with with those. I have a bag of super DFM. I haven't tried it yet, but I think for if you're starting with package bees, uh, may, maybe it's a good time to try them. It's supposed to have some beneficial bacteria that uh, uh, good fauna to help the bees start up. But if you're making splits, maybe it's not as necessary. Like package bees come away during transportation for two or three days. So you might it might help them. And I've used both. Um, and I, I like to try out supplements. I would say that there's not a lot of evidence that either um, or that really any of the supplements or the probiotics at this point make a huge difference. The one exception is I would say anything that has um, a strong lemongrass or wintergreen scent like um, Honey Bee Healthy or the homemade version will attract the bees to the liquid. So it won't necessarily, like sometimes people will see that it's better health, but really what it is is that the bees can't necessarily find the feeder. They don't do dances for food that shows up in the hive because there's no evolution for that because that just wouldn't happen in nature. So they they really have to bump into it. And so it helps them find the food more so they can take it in faster. So you do sometimes see a little faster eating when there is a, a feeding stimulant in there um, that's scented with one of the attractive scents. But besides that, there really isn't um, a lot of evidence, there isn't any evidence that they're they're worth it. Um, okay, should we, do you wanna move on or keep answering questions, Anna? I'll let you decide because there's well, a couple that are related. Let's let's go through the next section and we can get back to questions. Perfect. All right, I'll take it away, Megan. All right, so we're gonna talk about swarms and splits. And um, I told Anna that I would go fast through this because my happy amount of time to talk about this is an hour and a half minimum with hands-on. Um, but I did put the link in the chat about getting ready for splits. Um, this is from an ABJ article. I think I wrote it in a few years ago, but it's it still is pretty relevant. And it does address the main question that's showing up in the Q&A um, as to when you are supposed to do your splits. And one of the things that I always include in my talk, which is not my slide, I took it from somebody, but it talks about the 11 seasons of Michigan. And it's my favorite because the one that it, it lists Fool spring, and then it lists spring of deception, and then it lists third winter mud season, and then we get to actual spring. Um, and so every single year, so I live in Jackson County, and every single year, right around tax day, we get a warm up, and then I get a billion phone calls about people wanting to do splits, and then every single year, it gets cold and garbagey weather afterwards. And then it will warm up after that again. And that's usually the warm up when it makes more sense. That's still based on weather and what's outside. The way that you can really tell that a colony wants to be split or like the timing of when you should do it is by looking in the colony and seeing if it's getting the signals indicating that it's splitting time. So the two main signals that I'm looking for is whether or not I see full frames of brood. So if there's if there's a frame and I pull it out and but I mean by full frame is like actual edge to edge, then that's a full frame of brood that can that colony is going to be ready to be split. And what it's indicating is that, you know, the colony is gearing up to split itself. It's putting that energy in that big population, but also that you have a cluster that's big enough to cover that surface area. Um, the second thing that I'm going to be looking for is when you start to see backfilling. And so what I mean by backfilling is if you have that nice, you know, sheet of capped brood and when those bees emerge, ideally that brood nest is preserved so that the queen would just lay an egg in there. But when that colony is starting to feel crowded, then what will happen is that there'll be nectar coming in 
and those bees will emerge and the workers will fill it backfill it with nectar. So when you look at a frame of capped brood and you see liquid in there, that's what we call backfilling. And that's really the signal. And that's a super strong signal to the bees because what's happening there is that you're not getting queen scent anymore on all those eggs, which means that queen pheromone drops, which triggers swarm cell production. So if you can if you can go out and check on a couple of your hives and you see full frames of brood and you see um, the backfilling, that's an indication that that colony is ready to be split. Obviously, if you see queen cells, you're already um, at that point. All right, and I, yes, there's also a, we did a webinar on that um, last year as well. So one thing that you can do, which is like the easiest. So when we're talking about swarm management, I do say split, um, that's by far the thing that's gonna get you there. But if you just had two hives and one is big and one is small, just changing the um, location of them will make a really, really big difference. So you just switch them and then the foragers from the little hive will come back to the big hive and the foragers from the big hive will come back to the little hive. I don't know if these are gonna be animated in here. Yeah, sweet PowerPoint animations. I'm also an artist. Um, the other, so then the other two that I'm gonna talk about here are really dedicated or designed for people who haven't done splits yet because they're about a million different ways to do splits. Um, like I have a favorite method, other people have favorite methods and we'd be happy to talk about those in the question. Um, the real target is if you have an overwintered colony, you're going to want to manage it and do something to make it to prevent it from swarming. Um, and a lot of people I found are really, really intimidated by that process. So the, this method and the next method I'm going to show you are really designed for people that just aren't doing splits because they don't think that they can do it. So this is called, you can look this one up more, it's called the walk away or the dirty split. And you have a colony that's big, it's in two boxes, or you could have four mediums, but basically you take half the hive and put it in one spot and half the hive and put it in another spot. One of them will have the queen. The other one, you do need to make sure that both have eggs. And then as soon as, you know, four days later, you could really check in there. One will be making queen cells. One of them, you'll see eggs in there and you'll know which one she is. And the one that has the queen, you just manage as normal. The one that has the queen cells, you take really good notes so that you can come back and basically check on it after three weeks and make sure that it's queen right. And you can give both of them boxes. But that is why it's called a walk away split is you basically take the hives, set them in two spots and walk away. We use this all the time um, because, you know, at MSU we're labor limited a lot of the time. And so this is a very fast version of making a split. It works out most of the time. The worst case scenario is the queen in the one hive doesn't come back from a mating flight, in which case you just take it and use a sheet of newspaper and recombine those two hives and move on with life. And you've prevented a swarm in that case. This one, I don't actually know the official name. Someone taught it to me. And I call it the easiest split ever because I think it's actually even easier than the walk away split for some people. But basically in this slide, um, the brown is kind of the brood comb and the yellow is what would be honey-ish, but it doesn't even really matter what's on the comb. All you do is you mark every other comb. So here there's a red dot on the top of each frame. Um, you don't even have to mark them. I've talked to someone who just did A, B, A, B, A, B. And then what you do is you put all the A's in one hive and all the B's in one hive. The benefit of this over, and you can see they're all shoved to the middle with empty frames on the outside. The benefit of this method compared to the walk away split is sometimes your bees are not distributed evenly between the two boxes. So maybe there's way more brood in the top box or you know, way more brood in the bottom box. In this method, you get a much more even distribution. Same thing though, one will have a queen, one will not have the queen. You know, you could introduce a new queen if you purchased one or you just let the one that doesn't have a queen raise um, up a new queen. So. Those are the two easiest methods. All the rest of them, it's way nicer if you know where the queen is. Um, and a lot of times people say like, oh, I have no idea how to find the queen or I hate being able to find the queen. And I'm, I work full time plus do bees at home. I don't have time to find the queen. So what I do is this method here where this is the way my colonies look now. And I'll remove all the boxes. 
And this is my bottom box and this will still have frames in it and still will have bees in it in the original location. Then I set a completely empty box on top and this is no frames or anything. It just acts like a funnel. And then I just go through and I shake all the bees into the bottom box. I do a quick check. If I see the queen, I'll put her down in there. But basically I just shake the bees and take it from one box to another. And then if I've shaken all the bees from the frames, I know she's in that bottom box. And then I can put a queen excluder on and then I can restack the hive. And then I can come back and make my splits later if I want to, um, because the bees will go through and um, reorganize themselves at night. So actually the way that I do it is I'll shake the queen down, I'll reestablish putting all the brood up at the top. So I'll make my split in terms of what frames I want to take, but then I actually do the removal of the bees um, the nice day. So sometimes I'll take the time of looking for her. Um, one way that you can do that is just like a really nice way to make a split is basically do what the bees want to do, which is to take the queen and move her into another hive. So if I, if this beekeeper, you can see they have a really small nuke box. Um, you don't have to use a small nuke box. You can use your full size equipment, but basically they can take the queen out of this hive with, and put her in this box and let this whole hive um, requeen itself. And so again, this is just a method. What you're doing is you're removing the queen away from all the capped brood and that process will prevent a swarm from occurring. All right, so here's the, just a, a version of that. You've got your hive and let's say you've got eight frames. Um, so this is your overwintered hive, got eight frames that have bees on it. And then I add honey supers early in the spring to give them room to kind of push back swarming through that first bout of food. So this is what I've done already in the spring. Um, I did that before the warm up. And then I've got my new box with drawn comb. And you put two frames of food and two frames of brood in there. And then that's where the queen will go. And then in this case, you've again, like you've got the queen aside, you don't have, she's your backup. This one will now have a nice young queen. It will make tons of honey. Um, even when it's queenless, it'll still be bringing in lots of honey. And then again, worst case scenario, if she doesn't make a new queen, you could recombine it, but at least you haven't lost that workforce or been a public nuisance with your bees. So you've prevented um, swarming. All right, and then the, the, the last things that you can do if you don't wanna do splits is there's lots of ways you can do it. So we do a lot of our swarm management by making nukes. Um, you can just, again, it's pulling out those big frames of capped brood. You can do it for equalizing. So if you were that situation where you have the one big hive and the one little hive, you can take the frames of capped brood from the big hive and put it in the little hive. Just make sure that you are taking all the nurse bees with it. What you don't wanna do is move brood into a colony that can't cover it and then it's gonna get chilled. Um, another thing that I learned from Kirsten Trainer that they were doing in Germany is making a brood tower. And they basically just took all their capped brood from all their hives, put it into one big tower of young bees, treated that big tower for mites and let it emerge and then repositioned those nurse bees um, or use them for queen marine or things like that. So again, it is really just focusing on a method that you're getting the queen, separated from that huge incoming workforce of capped brood. All right, and so this is the way that I do it is um, I've often just left, you know, I'll take the um, all of the capped brood away and make a new nuke with it. I move them to another yard. You don't have to move your splits to another yard. You can leave them in the original location. You just have to remember that all the bees that know how to fly back to the original location will go to that original location. So if you wanna leave everything in the same yard, you have to make your splits, anything that's going into a new location, a little heavier. And then I tend to use queen cells. So I'll leave the original queen here, take all the brood and I'll put a queen cell in there, but that's because I'm really picky about which queens I'm using. You can allow them to raise up a queen. You can bring in mated queens if you don't wanna wait for the queen cell or you wanna have a little more consistency. At this time of year, you know nobody's raising queens locally. So you would be bringing them up from the South or from California um, to have a, a mated queen at this time. 
And then I often move them at the at night, um, but you can move them in the daytime. You just pay attention to to where the bees are going to end up. So, the you know the main point is that there is no particular right way to do it. You just have to find the one that works for your schedule and within your operation. I think the only way you can do it wrong is by not doing swarm management, because if you're not doing anything, those bees are going to head for the trees and really that is something that they're, they're not even going to head to the trees they're going to head to your neighbor's soffits and you're going to be a public nuisance with your bees and those bees are going to likely die so it is something that you want to take seriously all right and i think we covered this about that you don't have to move the splits to a new location um if you do want to move them it is good to let them breathe. So here we've got like a robbing screen on it that's really useful um, or just stapling um, hive. This is especially if you're gonna put them in your car. If you've got them back in the open bed of a truck, you don't have to cover them in, um, but you definitely, what you don't wanna do is do all of the work of splitting your hive and then putting them in like a plastic bag. Um, I did see someone who used like a laundry bag, like a mesh bag before, and that works really well or a tent or something like that. All right, and then after swarm season, this is the time of year. So there's two main points here is that if you need to have wax drawn, it's going to happen after swarm season. So if you've got foundation on your hives, you know, you're gonna not see a lot of them drawing even if you're feeding them until that feeling of being done swarming. And then if you need to draw comb, this is when you put it on. The other thing is that if you don't replace your queens, after swarm season is when the old queens will get replaced by the bees. So don't be surprised if you lose a queen in June and she's one that's really old, that is kind of the natural time for it. So that's one of the recommendations of why we change queens in the fall. But even if you don't replace your queens, it's just something to be aware that it's very natural to lose them at that time. All right, so anticipate that the colonies that have, that are big, they will absolutely swarm. That is their job. So it's something you have to be prepared about. You can tell it's getting close by watching the brood nest. And what you're looking for is full frames of brood and backfilling. Those are the two things that say it's imminent. And this is before you even see queen cells. Um, you can give them room outside the brood nest for nectar. I didn't really talk about that because that's something I usually do before this time. So that's a, a March thing. And then you're actually managing it by splitting the hives or somehow removing the brood away from where the queen is or giving her less. And then, so if you're doing your job well and covering Varroa mites and you've got all these extra colonies, like once you, once you get your Varroa management strategy, all of a sudden you'll have tons of bees in spring that need to be split. And then if you're a reasonable person and you only wanna have a normal amount of bees, you will have excess bees. If you're doing your job right as a beekeeper, you will have excess bees. The issue we have in Michigan is we have a boatload of hobbyists purchasing bees from out of state. So if we can have this excess of bees meet this demand for bees, that would be just lovely. And if you have questions about who needs them, we have 4-H, we have veterinary students, we have we have lots of people who, um, we've got veteran programs, we've got lots of people who would love to have your bees and just, talk, I mean, if you walk into your bee club and say, I have a really healthy overwintered nuke with, a local, with local bees, I'm sure you would have no problem getting rid of them. Um, and if you don't need the money for selling them, you can always donate it to our programs. All right, so I see lots of questions coming in. I'm going to sort through them while Anna covers Varroa. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. That was great. All right, so next we're going to talk about Varroa. Um, so um, we're just to remind you, we have lots of resources that we compile on our website. So pollinators.msu.edu, you can go under the resources for beekeepers. Uh, Megan did a really nice series of videos and articles understanding what colony loss due to, from Varroa looks like, talking about understanding Varroa risk and how to monitor Varroa mites through the alcohol wash or the powdered sugar roll tests, and then making a plan for Varroa. So looking at our different treatment options. Um, 
We will say that if you are new to monitoring varroa mites, it is a learning curve. You do have to practice. So um, once you know we really get into the beekeeping season here and temperatures are warm enough to work our colonies, bees are out flying and we're doing inspections, we're going to encourage you to really early on in the season, um, practice monitoring your bees. So there's really good guides that you and videos that you can look through on how to do an alcohol wash test or if, um, a powdered sugar will test. And practicing that early on, especially getting enough bees in your sample is a good practice. Uh, we have found that oftentimes beekeepers think they have 300 bees in their sample when actually it's much fewer bees. So um, you can even practice counting how many bees you've gotten in your sample if you're uh, wanting to make sure that you're doing the test correctly. Um, and then it, we also want you to think about trying to manage your mites and keeping the mite levels low throughout the season. Uh, some things to keep in mind for the spring. Uh, one is that many beekeepers are either have honey supers on right now or are putting honey supers on soon. And that's going to be honey that we're collecting for human consumption. So uh, different treatments have different rules, but there's only a few treatments that are allowed when honey supers are on and when we're collecting honey for humans. And those are our formic acid treatments, our oxalic acid treatment and hop guard treatments. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that we might be incorporating a brood break into our colonies, either, for example, if you're doing that walk away split and letting your bees raise a new queen, or if something happens to the queen, you lose a queen or they swarm, um, you might have a period of time when there is a break, break in the brood. And so that's something that can help keep our mite levels low, but it's also an opportunity for us as a beekeeper. So our most many of our treatments are going to be most effective when they're applied when there's not sealed brood in the hive. So for example, if you've done a walk away split or you have a package colony and there's a period where there's not any sealed brood, you might wanna consider a treatment at that point. For example, an oxalic acid treatment. Um, we use the oxalic acid dribble on colonies when there's little or no brood. And then finally, uh, I'll just mention that a lot of our colonies are pretty small this time of year, either because we're buying packages or nukes or we're splitting colonies. And so there are certain treatments that aren't suitable for small colonies. So you do want to read the label and see if it has a minimum colony size requirement. For example, our formic acid treatments shouldn't be done with a colony that's like a five frame nucleus colony. So five frames of bees or, or, or smaller. So pay attention to those size requirements on the labels. Um, and I'll, I'll guess I'll let, oh, I, the last point I wanted to make was that mite management is really tricky because it, it varies colony to colony within the same bee yard, in the same practices, colony to colony, we'll see different levels of mites. It also varies yard to yard and it varies year to year. So we have um, experience monitoring MSU colonies in our yards and each year is different, each yard is different. And so you really um, should just, you know, make sure that it's something that you're constantly thinking about is monitoring and managing varroa mites and trying to keep the mite levels low throughout the beekeeping season. Anything you all wanna add there, Megan, Dan, or Zach? There's, there are a couple questions about um, Varroa, if you're happy to keep going. Absolutely. So one person asked, um, they already use oxalic acid, but what would you recommend for IPM that they could add in to that? Sure. So uh, that's a great question. I think it's really going to depend on your colony, on your situation. So um, for most of the season, you might have honey supers on. So then the other treatments that you'd be able to use would be either hop guard or formic acid. Um, formic acid's a nice option if you have a lot of sealed brood in the hive, which is often the case in the middle of the summer. Um, but hop guard is also an option for you there. Um, you just want to pay attention to the temperature requirements on the label and making sure that you're applying those treatments when, when the conditions are right for those specific treatments. Um, but those so normally we're kind of looking at, you know, most of our beekeeping season, we have honey supers on our most productive colonies. So we're limited to oxalic acid, formic acid, and hop guard. Um, in the fall, we could, if after we've pulled our honey supers, we can consider a thymol-based treatment. So we like apigard or apolife bar. Um, and then there's some other treatments as well. Um, some beekeepers will use uh, apivar, which is an amitrez treatment in the spring, but you have to do it early in you have to read the label to make sure that it's before several, Dan, do you know the exact number of days before honey supers go on? 
or Megan? I'll look no, it up. I was going to try to look it up really. I'll put the label in the chat. But. So there's a certain, so the treatment takes a certain amount of time and that ha treatment has to be finished a certain number of days before you put honey soup. I, yeah, on. I don't know offhand. Yeah. Okay. So that's, um, so that's just something where at this time of year for most beekeepers, that's probably not going to be very practical. And then the other thing about that treatment is there's more and more research looking to see um, or that's finding you're suggesting resistance to that um, treatment chemical, which is amitraz. Yeah. And I, I think if that it is like Anna mentioned and Zach's been putting in the, the Q and A, like there are lots of options and that is where that honeybee health coalition guide is really useful because it does have a, a, a choosing tool. If you're overwhelmed by the options, um, I think one of the most useful tools that we have is Formic. So if you buy the um, Formic Pro, because you can use it in the summer, you can use it when honey supers are on, the only thing you have to watch is that it can't be above 85 um, degrees Fahrenheit when you're using it. Um, there's a couple questions about monitoring, Anna. So someone said that they had been looking at, they were monitoring, but they did lose their co um, colony ultimately. And um, they were using the alcohol wash and they were getting 350 bees in it. And they were looking through a coffee filter. Um, did they have to use a microscope or why weren't they seeing any mites still? So maybe if you want to just talk about some like tips or tricks for using the alcohol wash. Sure. Um, so that's great that you're you're trying and that you're also counting the number of bees. Um, we um, and so I, so I mean, one thing that we we can point out is that we're trying to co control the varroa mites because they're spreading viruses between colonies and between bees in the colony. And so um, trying to keep those mite levels low is how we're also trying to manage and keep the virus levels low. Uh, but the virus levels and different types of virus can vary colony to colony. So it isn't always going to be, you know, one colony with a certain mite level isn't going to have this exact same experience necessarily as another colony with the same mite level because those those virus levels can be different. Um, as far as tips and tricks, I mean, I think it's good if you're trying to make sure you have enough bees in your sample um, and then making sure that you're using a system where the bees are actually getting dislodged from the, or sorry, the mites are getting dislodged from the bees. Um, Dan uses a lot of sieves in his job. I don't know if you want him to explain that, that method. Um, yeah. And as you know, um, the basics are not kind of covered, but yeah, it, basically we use two sieves. Um, and the, the first one is just big enough that your mites are going to pass through and your bees aren't. So something like a number eight, like an eighth inch, um, but like, a, you know, a standard soil sieve. And I usually work with a dish dish tub underneath just a dollar store white dish tub light background helps to see mites. Um, but if you pour your alcohol bee as you're, you know, just as you're finishing shaking, don't let things settle to the bottom of the jar, pour them through. Um, and it should, your bees will stay in the sieve and your mites should come through to that dish tub where you should be able to pick them up or visually. Um, you can also do an extra pour over rinse of more alcohol across those bees, because even though if you dislodged them, um, they will just kind of, the bees act as kind of a filter in and of themselves. So pouring more of the solution over them will dislodge any others. Um, and then I use just a very fine sieve, essentially just strain. I, I'm going to do my count of mites in the tub, but I'll use a fine sieve to essentially clean those mites out of the alcohol to reuse. Um, and then when it gets too cloudy from debris and pollen and cloudy and foamy, I, you know, get, get fresh alcohol to start with. But uh, yeah. And there, there is a question just on visualizing them. Um, not everybody can see them with their eyes. And so two things that can be really useful for that is um, using your phone and taking photos of whatever you're shaking the bees into or whatever container you're using, because you can always blow that up and, you know, confirm if that's a speck or if it's a mite. Um, actually, three things. The, the other thing is you can use a magnifying glass. Um, so we put together kits for people that will include a magnifying glass. And then the third thing is just bringing a young person into the yard. Um, they can see it and it's good to be teaching people too. Um, someone asked about using um, drone frames or drone brood removal for varroa control. Um, Anna, do you want to talk about that too? Yeah, so that's um, one strategy to try to keep mites low throughout the season. It's normally not going to be enough by itself, but it can be um, part of your overall mite management strategy. 
And so there's lots of different ways people do this. One way is by purchasing frames that have the larger cell size printed onto the foundation. And so then the bees draw out the larger cells and the queen lays on fertilized eggs and drones develop in those cells. And then the beekeeper removes that frame after the brood has been capped. And since the mites prefer drone brood over worker brood, the idea is that it, the drone brood kind of acts as a trap. A lot of the mites will hopefully end up in that sealed drone brood. You remove it, so you're uh, you're sacrificing that drone brood, but you're also um, killing the mites. Um, some beekeepers will put the frame in the freezer and then return the frame back several days later and let the bees clean it out. Some beekeepers feed the drone brood to their chickens if they have chickens. Um, so there's different options there, but that's one way to do it really systematically. The thing you want to be really careful about, though, is that you have to remove that. Um, if this is your strategy for managing mites, you want to remove that frame before the drones emerge. Drones have a longer pupil period, and so uh, the mites can emerge with from with more daughters if they are reproducing in drone cells. So you want to make sure you're really good at calendars and that you're removing that sealed drone brood um, when it's sealed before those drones begin emerging. And then there's also other ways that beekeepers do it that's a little bit um, maybe less systematic, where if there's extra drone brood between the boxes, they might just um, scrape that off with their hive tool and put it in the bucket during inspections. Or sometimes beekeepers will use, uh, you know, a frame that um, with just a starter strip of foundation and the bees will draw out some drawn comb and then they'll just remove that comb throughout the season. So all of those are options for you. Great. So I'm just going to go through some questions um, as they come in. So um, maybe Zachary, if you want to try this one. Um, so Rebecca has been having problems with skunks and raccoons, or at least somebody has been trying to get in her hives and take um, like inspection boards out every night. And it seems to be they're more defensive. Do you have any recommendations for dealing with small pests? Uh, that's, it's tough if it's uh, raccoons. Uh, the only way, if frames are, I would say it's probably raccoons. And if the, they will keep coming back, that's uh, unfortunate. Thing. The only thing you could do is maybe have a tie down to tie the hives together so then they won't come back, won't be coming back. But if you see uh, the front of the entrance with uh, some soil turned loose, usually as, as some patches of grass missing, and that, that would be signs of skunk. And most people would just put a piece of board with some nails pointing up in the, on the landing board of the beehive. And what skunks do is they try to roll the bees using their paws to get rid of the stinger before they eat them. So the, the nails will get to their paws and they probably will quit after a night or two. So this depends on the animal. So I would say if your friends are, that's probably more like raccoon. Skunks usually do not do that. Skunks will just eat live bees at the entrance. Uh, so raccoons, I would, I would just uh, have them tied down, tied up. Probably after a week or two, they probably will stop coming back. I haven't had issues with uh, raccoons unless it's empty hive uh, or a weak hive. Usually, if the colony is strong enough, bees will take care of, will chase them away. Uh, so, but skunks will come to a strong hive even because they do it at night. And they only eat some bees in front of the entrance. So, they, are, they have different strategies. Yeah, and I know a lot of beekeepers keep them in areas with raccoons and skunks and don't have a problem, but um, yeah, I think as Zachary mentioned, the ratchet strap makes a huge difference. Um, so on, on that note, someone asks how to get rid of mice as well. Dan, do you want to take that? Or deter mice? Yeah, um, deter. And so best bet here is, is mechanical exclusion, basically. Um, and so, you know, mice are most often a problem in the winter in a colony. Um, usually in, when it's warm temperatures, your bees are active and assuming they're, you know, in a reasonable amount of equipment for the size of the population, they're kind of patrolling their own space and a mouse isn't, isn't going to 
tolerate uh, getting harassed by bees. But in the winter, um, in the fall, late summer, those mice are looking for somewhere warm. A beehive's got food and dry and all the things it wants. So actually blocking, physically blocking the entrances. Now you still you don't want to compromise airflow and you don't want to um you certainly don't want to exclude the bees either. So like a, a half inch hardware cloth across the entrance. Um and if you've got like auger holes or you put like a top shim or something on because mice can climb. So basically you want any anything that's bigger than like a half inch, you want to put hardware cloth or something over that'll let the bees go and let airflow happen, but physically keep a mouse out. Um, they will chew through things. So if you have like an entrance reducer that that reduces the depth of your entrance down, they will chew through that. So putting like some mesh across that as well. Um, but really deterrent um, is, is they're just physically excluding them. And for something like stored equipment, uh, I've seen a lot of beekeepers stacking it, but like with a queen excluder above and below, because you've got that nice metal grid that a mouse, it can't physically chew through that. So just creating physical barriers to keep them out is, is your best bet there. And on our, our pest control theme, there are a couple of questions about bears and that one you will need electric fencing, but Michigan does have a nice document on that. So um, if you are in an area with bears, I just put a link in the chat. That's also on the MBA website um, of how to set up uh, fencing for bears. Um, all right. How about, let's see, Dan, do you want to go on this one of recommendations? Actually, Dan and then Zachary, too, I know you'll have input about plants that you would re recommend planting for northern Michigan. Um, for somebody that has land that they want to support pollinators on or bees, um, I guess. Yeah, and and, and a, not knowing your your space, I will say, while it's a much longer term play, trees are always a great option because you're kind of working in three dimensions, um, and so that things like you know maples and willows and basswoods and um, um, uh, sorry, I'm blanking locusts. You know, the, these are all big honey plants, the maples and willows kind of early and the, and the others kind of later in the season. So th those can be good if you're thinking at this from a long term, really investing in a piece of property, um, habitat and forage. Um, as far as like annuals planting or, or things that will become perennial, clover's good, buckwheat is really good. Um, the bees, that's really good bee forage. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there. I know there's a lot of um, resources as well from MSU and otherwise on plantings for pollinators and some programs, but Zachary is much more um, probably plant knowledge than I have. So I'll let you carry on. And I, I did just put the link in the chat for the pollinator resources, which does have lots of planting lists, but Zach, do you have more recommendations? Uh, yeah, for Michigan, uh, there's... Uh... If it's a swampy area, there's a plant, uh, I forgot the name, that has a, a flower, a white flower that has a ball like button bush. Button bush, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it's swampy, button bush is good. But there's also a Asian tree, a Seven Suns tree that has been planted in Michigan. It's a very good honey plant. But I, I don't think it's invasive, so you don't have to worry about that. It's, and it's a good uh, honey plant. BB tree, some some say it's invasive, but I others say they have seeds and they have trouble germinating them. So I don't know. I haven't. There's a big tree in at MSU campus. I don't even see any seedling, and there is that huge tree. So I don't think it's invasive. Uh, but BB tree, it's of course it's not a native. It's again. Uh, tree from China, but it's just so wonderful with bees. You can hear 10,000 bees humming when you go there, when they're blooming. And uh, it's also interesting biology. They bloom male flowers first, then the branches will die off for like a week or two. And there's a new shoots coming out and blooming female flowers. I still don't know how they cross pollinate unless the other tree reverses. <laughs> so they all they are totally dis not synchronized, maybe. So 
because they blow they the male and females are like two or three weeks apart. So then they have to cross pollinate. So there's a big tree at MSU and I have I have blog on my website bees.msu.edu if you are interested in bee plants. I have about fifty seven or sixty bee blogs about different flowers. Uh, mostly mostly Michigan plants. A few a few plants from China, but maybe 85, 90 percent are Michigan plants. So tulip poplar is another one that's good in Michigan. So as, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I was just saying, no, that was great, Zachary. Um, like, yeah. but obviously, what you heard from both of those responses is the the woodies make such a big difference. If you do have, if you're just looking for coverage like hayfields and you've got lots of space, or you don't have time or money to put in the woodies, you can look at a like clover buckwheat mix for cover crop. That'll put a lot down for large space, but I think the the more natives you can get in there, the better. They just take a lot longer. Okay, so I'll send, I'm gonna give you two questions back to back. So the first one is someone who's interested in beekeeping. Mm. Um, they live in Crawford com country, County, a very beautiful part of Michigan. And they wanna know about groups near them, um, which I know you may not know offhand, but do you wanna just point them to the resources for, or you know, how they should find a group and resources for beginners? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll go ahead and just share my screen right now. Um, so this is the Michigan Beekeepers Association's website, um, michiganbees.org. And then if you go to Michigan Bee Clubs, so you should see a whole list of Michigan Bee Clubs, and they're organized by location. So you should be able to locate your county on the map and then figure out that district and see the different clubs. They have different club contacts and then all these different um, um, information about the clubs when they meet. Um, but the main thing is that there's a contact there and that'll help you figure out how to get connected. Um, so I know some bee clubs are closer to people than others. You might have to drive a little bit, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to find one close enough to you. I will say just from talking with our colleagues from around the country, I think Michigan has a way more bee clubs to sort support local beekeepers than many other states. There's some states that just have a few or they have one main statewide organization, but they don't have so many local bee clubs. So we're really lucky here in Michigan to have over 30 beekeeping clubs. As far as ways to get started with beekeeping, um, and we would definitely recommend that you read a book on honeybee biology. I'll, one of the people I first learned beekeeping from would say, you know, if you understand the honeybee biology, you're much, it's much easier to understand beekeeping and how to manage bees. So that would be something that would be important. There's lots of books out there on honeybee biology. So um, starting there and then um, going to our website, we have resources compiled at um, with the link that Megan just put in the chat. So it's pollinators.msu.edu. And then you go to the beekeepers page and you'll find a lot of information there. Um, so be local bee club, website, read a book, and then reach out when you have questions. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, there's a YouTube video, uh, Michigan Bee Plants, I think by me. I thought I, thought I remember that. I'm not sure I've given so many talks, I don't remember which ones are <laughs> on YouTube, but I'm pretty sure there's one on bee plants. Yeah. Yep. And on the bee, bee plants, someone did ask if hemp makes a good bee plant and it is a wind pollinated, so the bees don't tend to collect it. Um, okay, the next question is back to Varroa. So um, it said, should they treat mites after splitting or maybe you could maybe reword it as what could you use for after splits or how does it work with the timing after splits yeah that's a great question so after splitting um is a time when you can consider mite management strategies um we often use formic acid in that kind of window after splitting as long as the colonies are strong enough to handle it so again um not doing it on little baby five frame nucleus colonies, but once colonies are strong in population and we have those temperature windows of um, 50 to 85 degrees, then we can consider a formic acid treatment. Um, hop guards are gonna be another option for colonies. Um, you can use it with some of the smaller colonies, but in my experience, it does kill some brood. So I don't wanna use hop 
guard personally until I have enough brew to that I can lose a little bit and the colony can still be okay. And then again, that oxalic acid treatment when we have those broodless periods. Um, but any of those would be options for you in the time after splitting, especially if you have honey supers on your colonies. And the, the one thing about splits, as Anna mentioned, like some of them are a little difficult with brood in there, but if you are using queen cells or allowing them to requeen, you will have a broodless period. And that's when hop guard and oxalic acid become really, really useful. Like the combination of a queen cell plus a well-timed hop guard. Um, there's someone down at Auburn University that's doing studies on that method and has found that it's really, really um, useful. I'm going to jump back. So Zachary mentioned a webinar recording he did on Michigan bee plants. So I just put the link to that recording in the chat. And then Fred asks, so going back to splits, the Demeray method is another way to prevent swarming. Have you used this method and what's been your success with it? Um, so I mentioned that we all have our favorites. A modification of the Demeray is my favorite. Um, and I just am going to share my screen just briefly with a slide just to show what I'm talking about. Um, so this is, and this is just one step of it, and I'm happy to talk more about this with people later. But basically, what you do is you shake the queen down to the bottom, and you, or you keep somehow the queen at the bottom. You put drawn comb in the middle, and then you have the brood up at top. The reason that I like, and and you do this on a really warm day. So when we get that one day when it's like 70, so perhaps Thursday when it's going to get warm, for some of us, it maybe is going to get warm enough. And we've got colonies that are ready to split, but you know it's going to be cold right after, which is exactly the scenario that we're in. You go out on the nice day, you rearrange the hive like this, and then you close it up. What it does is it allows it that this the, it's not going to swarm once it's in this position until it really refills again. So this buys you enough time to get through the next warm period. If you've got enough drawn comb in between the queen and the brood, then what you have is you'll actually get them to start raising queen cells up top. Um, so that's one version of doing it is letting them start to raise queen cells. Obviously, you need to move those boxes off before they those queen cells emerge. Um, but this is a, a lovely way to actually get the queen cells started. The way that I do it is I move them up and then I use my own queens in there as well. So um, it's a great method. It works for lots of people. It works really well at this time of year because you're basically stopping the swarm from happening, but you're really reducing the chance that they will get chilled after. So when you get that one little bit of warmth, you can put the bees in this configuration and then it buys you one more week. And as everyone knows at this time of year, that one week is really, really, really useful. Um, so this is probably the one that I do the, the most. And that's outlined in that um, swarm document. And then there is another question about using the Snell Grove board. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have used it. I've I've never actually used it. I've gone through the process of learning how to use it. I am not a retired British person in a garden with two hives that has unlimited time to go through it. But it is something that works. It's delightful. Um, if you only had like two hives, it just takes a very, very long time. Um, there's a question about... Um, Dan, if you want to talk about using frames from a colony that died early winter from Varroa, and I'm happy to chip in if, sure. if you need it. Yeah, and, and this is a common question. Um, and <laughs> it's a little complicated in the answer because it, so again, it's it's not the Varroa that killed your bees as much as it's the viruses that they vector. And, and we don't have a complete understanding of viruses and whether like, to what degree they hang around on comb and can then be transferred. So there, there's certainly incomplete information there. Um, but saying that it's fairly common practice to use it, you know, if you can, if you can, you know, if you're sure it didn't die from something like American fall brood or European or something like that, um, it's pretty common to reuse um, frames from, from a dead out. Um, you know, we typically, Michigan is nice because we, we do have a cold winter. So if it died and it either sat out in the bee yard or sat in an unheated garage or shed, you know, as long as it was protected from pests, kind of that cold is your friend. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, but again, to, to what degree, what's on that comb biologically and chemically 
There's a lot of unknown there. It can be an opportunity to call some of your worst frames if you have something that certainly has dead brood remaining on it, where you can see the last remnants of a brood nest with kind of cappings and, and dead dead bees. That Those can be a good opportunity to call those frames. But again, bee gear is not cheap. We understand the desire to reuse, but you should be thinking of turning over a percentage of your frames every year anyways, just for kind of good colony health. But Megan, you can... No, I think I think that's really good. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind, whatever bees you're putting back in are not going to be sterile, you know, so everything we're doing is reducing the disease risk, but we're not ever going to be able to, like, get rid of it completely and start new because those worker bees will come from another hive with their own history. But plenty of people do reuse colon um, equipment from colonies that died. And with just one thing to to clarify, too, is we're so the varroa mites spread viruses, we're concerned about viruses kind of hanging around, um, but the varroa mites themselves can't live outside of the honeybee colony. So if your colony dies from varroa mites, there's dead varroa mites, there's not live varroa mites that are still living in your colony. And I don't know, maybe Zach knows how long a varroa mite can live outside of a honeybee colony, but it's a matter of hours, right, Zach? Yeah, I'd say half a day. Uh, in the lab, I have mites that would die probably about six hours without food. About half of them would die six hours. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> like I just, and, and one thing too, that is a really good point that Anna mentioned is that the varroa will be gone, but the, the viruses that the varroa transmit, a lot of them are actually older viruses that the bees have an association with, they're only really dangerous when they're transmitted by the varroa mite. So for example, deformed wing virus can be sexually transmitted, vertically transmitted, mouth to mouth transmitted. And it's not that it doesn't cause the deformed wings when it's transmitted that way. So if the bees pick it up off the comb, it's not the same as when they get it injected into them when they're a developing pupa. That's when all the problems start. So having having the viruses there is not the same risk as having the viruses in the presence of the varroa mites. Um, there is a question that I'm going to take. It's on whether there's data on the oxalic acid dribble, um, or no, sorry, on the extended release oxalic acid. Do you think this will be approved soon? So um, the extended release oxalic acid, the reason that it hasn't been approved is that there is no data to show that it works well. And the earlier versions of this, um, when Randy was putting out the um, versions that were with like shop towels and things like that, um, we were not able to get a lot of efficacy. What I will say is that um, I'm actually in conversation tomorrow with a group of people that are looking at redoing the oxalic acid label, but there is a national group of researchers in conversation with the EPA and the USDA that's investigating this. And if there are data that show that it works, that is how we get the labels changed when it is actually appropriate. And that is something that people are looking into. One of the things is for us in Michigan, we're really, really lucky in that um, we can use formic acid in the summertime. So that that window that is so important for a lot of people in warmer climates where it's too hot, like the reason people are so excited about extended release oxalic is they don't have access to formic. For us, it's, you know, we need more tools that'll be way better once we have more Varroa tools, but it doesn't necessarily fill like this gap for us um, that we don't have. So um, like I said, like there's definitely people looking into it. There is a big group looking at all the different ways we can use oxalic acid. But right now, if you use it per the label and use Formic for that time where you would think about wanting that extended release, that should give you the, the coverage that you um, need. And then hopefully I'll know more tomorrow too. Um, and then there is another question on oxalic acid about, um, maybe Anna, if you want to do it, about the dribble on the package prior to the brood getting capped or nine days after installation, um, how it is, I think 
they're asking about queen supersedure, but um, also just how you would use both of those methods. Sure. And so, um, I mean, the question's asking about, is there an impact on queen supersedure? And that's something that I haven't heard any reports or data on. Um, but the way that, so there's a couple of different ways to use oxalic acid with new colonies. Um, there, on the oxalic acid label, there is an option for treating the package while it's still on that package box with oxalic acid. Uh, I did this once, but you do have to wait, according to the label, a couple of days between, after you treat them before you hive the package. And I personally like to hive my packages as soon as I can and get them in the hive. So what I've done when I, we have package colonies is I install them, I come back a few days later, and then before they're sealed brood in the hive, I'll do an oxalic acid dribble. Um, the dribble is really nice because you can adjust it based off the colony size. You're using um, a certain amount of solution based off the number of seams of bees you have. And so for really small colonies, you can just use a small amount of treatment um, according to the label. So that's one option. Um, for other colonies, you know, again, if you have a, ideally we're using the oxalic acid treatment when there's not sealed brood in the hive because that's when it's most effective. Um, so that's, we're trying to identify those windows of opportunity. Um, and speaking about windows, um, when does brood normally stop in Michigan, the end of having brood season? So in the lower peninsula of Michigan where we keep a lot of bees, I see brood through October. It depends on the colony. Um, there's definitely some colonies that rear brood later into the season than others, but normally I'll still be, I'll still see some brood in October. Anything? Other experiences? No, that sounds good. That is another thing that they're doing a national study to try to figure out, but is really well, it's really variable and nobody knows for sure. Um, I, would, I would say strong colonies will have brood men tiny amount, maybe until as late as middle December. Yeah. But definitely October, I see lots of brood. Mm -hmm. Even when we stop flying, I will still have brood probably for about a month. So I would say a good rule of thumb is as soon as we stop flying, give, it, give them three to four weeks after that, that will stop. So that's about that's about right. If you most most of the time I'll be stop flying here, I would say around the November first, and then about a month after that, they probably have very little brood left. And then let's say they start brewery in about middle February in Northern Michigan here. All right, I'm gonna do two more questions and then we'll see if we can be done at 8.30. So um, someone said, Dan, if you wanna do this one, if you've got wax moths bad in a dead out hive, can you just scrape the frames and reuse them or do you need to do something special with them? Um, yeah, wa wax moth is not something I consider as like a transmitter of diseases pathogens. It's, it's more of a nuisance than anything. Um, if you leave it long enough, it will eat right back to clean foundation. Um, I will say the, the one issue with, and I'm assuming you have plastic foundation in the frames or something like that. It does need, you need to get back to that nice, clean hexagon template that you started with. If you do a poor job scraping and it's, it's, um, it's not a clean template for them to start on, you're going to get all sorts of burr comb and, and drone comb and, and cross comb and that. So if you can get it back to a clean surface, then um, I get yeah, no issue with reusing it from a biological standpoint. And just to add to that, so sometimes beekeepers, if they do scrape the comb off of their plastic foundation, will find that they need to reapply a really thin coat of beeswax onto that plastic foundation so that the bees draw out that comb again. And then, um, so there are two questions about just new upcoming varroa treatments. I like, like everybody, I'm super excited. There are a lot of researchers working on it and trying to get new data. Um, and like, thankfully, but um, there doesn't seem to be anything that will be new this year um, that is coming in in the pipeline. On uh, the the. Um, dead out thing can you reuse old pollen frames with spring bees dan if you want to keep going yeah you can but again it's it's a good opportunity to um call some things as, as we want to be thinking about replacing a 
percentage of frames every year. And a lot of times you get those frames of old pollen where it's it's kind of shiny. You can tell it just takes on a sheen. Those frames often get quite heavy and they can be a little deceptive when you're just hefting a hive to make sure it's it's got enough food. Um, so you don't have to, but the, the pollen does kind of lose its freshness um, after an extended period. And generally in Michigan, we're, we're pretty fortunate here compared to a lot. I don't know the whole state, but a lot of places in the state, we have an abundance of pollen in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. A lot of places around the country do not have that. So there's much more need for supplemental feeding and pollen's a lot more precious here. Um, generally, we have it in abundance. And so it can be a good opportunity to pitch some older frames or work them to the outside of your colony with the idea of, of you know, they're the next ones to go when you are culling. All right, and then we've got two more questions, or one more question, and we've got about seven minutes, but I think we can do it as a fast round robin. If it says, what are your objectives for your personal apiaries this year? I think I would like to know what people, the thing they're most excited about trying this year. Um, I'm gonna go first and I'm gonna do the thing this year. I swear that I always say that I'm going to do, and I'm gonna try to do a lot more two queen systems. Um, which I'm excited about, but I have not done more than just a couple. So that's mine. Anna, do you want to go? Sure. And um, we'll put in the chat if you don't know what a two queen system is. Dan wrote a really nice blog post about uh, one of the one of the ways to set up that system. Sure. So um, so Dan and I manage our beekeeping business together because we're married, and a lot of the things that we're trying to do really are just selling nukes to beekeepers and honey production. Uh, one of the things that I think we're doing this year is uh, using the push and cage method to introduce queens into our new colonies, into our splits. So we purchased uh, mated queens from a beekeeper. And then in order to introduce those queens and to improve um, introduction, the rate at which the bees accept these new queens, we're going to use push and cages. And I think we can share a resource or a picture to that in the chat too. Dan, what else are we doing new this year that we're um, excited about? Um, new bee yards. And that's exciting to me because it's new landowners. Um, it's and, and they are, I'm excited because they're in proximity to historically good bee yards. Um, so I, I have, you know, as far as wintering and production, I feel good about the landscape. Um, but I like the, it happens to be a dairy farm. Um, I like the interaction. I like being part of the agricultural landscape and talking to farmers, even though, you know, they raise cows and I don't know much about dairy cows. It's great when you stop and, you know, chat on the tailgate and how's it going. And so just that opportunity to be kind of part of the, the ag landscape. We'll tell them about bees. He'll put a veil on, come have a look. I'll learn about, you know, cows and things. So I like that aspect of it. Zachary, what are you most excited about? So my goal is contrary to what beekeepers want, I want to have mites. <laughs> because I have a small grant to study how to control mites. To do that, I need to have mites. So my my uh, plan is to concentrate mites from colonies by moving drone brood uh, from about 20, 23, 24 colonies into two or three colonies. Hopefully, I would, uh, by doing that, I would have enough drones uh, maybe by July or August. Because usually, unless you do that, usually you don't see a lot of mites enough that you can study until too late, like uh, September, October. You only have a month left to study them. So that's my goal. I, I like, I want to end here on Zachary being the evil scientist breeding the mites. Um, but on that note, like it is really a nice way to have it. If you do have lots of mites or you do have parasitic mite syndrome, we'll be looking for colonies again for our research. So you can always, if it does go south, um, you can always reach out to us and we'll, we'll make something really lovely out of you know, your missed opportunities. So, um, well, 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 yeah, I paid somebody to to buy her mighty hive because it was loaded with <laughs> mites. One, one sugar, one 300 B jar, I got like 300 mites. So, so I actually paid money to get all that mites from her hands. 
Well, then if your honey flow doesn't work out, you can always sell your mites to Zachary. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you so much for those of you who stuck around and for all of the really, really good questions. And hopefully we will see a lot of you at upcoming workshops. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.